Johnny, we got Logan O'Hoppy. We've got Zach Neto. Who's the next prospect to join the roster? Well, Lindsey Crosby is joining us today, and he's going to tell us who it is. It's time to get locked on with Mike and John, and this is Locked On Angels. You are Locked On Angels, your daily Los Angeles Angels podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And John and I thank you for making Lockdown Angels your first listen of the day. We are available on all platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the best way to help us out is by giving us a rate and a review. We love five stars. And those watching on YouTube, make sure that you're subscribed and click the bell to be notified when a new episode drops. And today's show is brought to you by HelloFresh. You can skip the trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MLB 60. Use the code MLB 60 for 60% off your order plus free shipping. Did you say hello, Frish? Is that what you said? <laughs> fresh. Hello, Frish. Oh, fresh, fresh, <laughs> fresh, fresh. Thanks for being here with us for this episode of Lockdown Angels, where it's your team every day. You've got the Frish Brothers here with you, aka the Super Halo Bros. My name is John, and that's my brother Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother John. We've been fans of this team for years, and we're so grateful to be here for our second season covering the Halos on Locked On Angels with you. Hey, coming up on Friday, we have Fan Mail Friday. Probably have a lot of things to say about our Halos especially after the weekend that was. Keep and on clean. today's show, <laughs> I know, right? On today's show, Lindsey Crosby joins us a little bit later on. He's going to be talking about Zach Neto. And, of course, we're going to revisit our conversation about Logan O'Hoppy and how he's performed so far this season. And, of course, if you're an everydayer here with us, we thank you. You've been here since day one. We thank you. And if you're joining us for the first time, we also thank you. So we're excited to have you here with us. Mike, let's recap yesterday's game that we all set our alarms early for to watch right. Shohei Otani pitch. And then he only pitched two innings. Let's talk right. about it. Oh, it was such a bummer. So I didn't set my alarm. I actually woke up thinking I missed maybe the start of the game and then realized <laughs> that the delay caused the game to be delayed. The rain did. And yes. so I was excited. So I got up and I grabbed my, my hot chai. I don't drink coffee. I grabbed my hot chai. I was having breakfast, got to watch the game and I got to watch Shohei Otani look really, really good. And then, what, two and a third innings, I think, is where it was. And then the rain came down and the floods came up. And <laughs> it, it just was a mess out there. I mean, there yeah. was that whole delay where they had to come out and put new dirt around the home plate and mm -hmm. put new dirt on the mound. They had Pitch to Pitchcom wasn't in. working. Oh, it, was just, it was just a <laughs> mess, right? The good news that was really exciting was that we actually – won the game. Yes. We didn't lose four in a row. Right. We had our stopper on the mound. And so we were excited about getting the win five to four right now. We're at 500, eight and eight. That does feel kind of good after a really terrible, we beat ourselves kind of weekend. Mm -hmm. And it was also a bummer to not see Shohei Otani be able to really win this game. Cause I think he was well on his way to winning this game and it wasn't going to be close. He left the game leading five to one. And then the Red Sox just chipped away and chipped away and chipped away. But fortunately we got that victory and it started Johnny with Hunter Renfro, your, yes, your sneaky, good, possibly an all-star this year. You called that one and he had a great first inning. Why don't you talk about it? Yeah. He had a three run home run in the first four RBIs across the entire game. Now what's, what's with the Angels scoring early scoring often in the first like three innings and then just, Totally blanking for the yeah. rest of the game. <laughs> yeah, that's been really frustrating, right? And what's interesting is that it feels kind of the opposite of what they were doing last year. Not that they were scoring a bunch of runs in the later innings, but it felt like they could never get out to a lead last year. This year, yeah. they've gotten the lead, I believe... They've had the lead in almost every game, and mm -hmm. in those games, they've lost, I think, seven of them yeah. when they've come out with a first inning or second inning lead, which is really exciting, but then the anxiety starts to build, and you wonder, like, are they going to be able to hold this? And we, we had Shohei on the mound, so I was like, oh, of course they're going to be able to, right. to do this, and then the rains came. <laughs> yeah, even the weather hates the Angels, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> it's the Not, baseball gods. They're yeah, mad at us. <laughs> they're mad at us. Listen, uh, congratulations to Zach Neto for getting his first yes. major league hit. Man, I keep saying it. He's got a great eye at the plate, Mike. And he's not swinging at junk. Yeah. He swung at a fastball that was up, was able to bloop that right in into left field. So that was awesome. He came around to score, which was great to see as well. Yeah. And 
he is great on the bases, John. He knows what he's doing on the bases. He's fast. He goes first to third. He's a threat. They threw over a couple of times. In fact, one of those times they threw over, it caused an error, and so he was able to go to second base. Like, Zach Neto at the top of this lineup, I kind of dig, and he's obviously got to start hitting a bit, but I kind of like it, even though Taylor Ward's been good. He's been slumping, and so maybe there might be something to having Z- having Zach Neto lead off. I would like him back down in the order for now, just because it's a whole new environment. I think that's a sure. lot of pressure to put on sure. him. I understand that's where he was batting in double a, but Mike, he he's a pitch to contact guy. And right now the contact is there, but they're not landing for hits. And so I think you go back to your Taylor Ward leading off for now, Mike, it feels like this team had a stern talking to between <laughs> yeah. Sunday and Monday because yeah. you said it, Zach Neto went first to third Gio Rochella also went first to third. Yep. They were really aggressive taking that extra base and it paid off and it pays off when the field is junk because it's soaking wet from the rain. So they took advantage of that. This team had a whole different outlook and hustle to it on Monday. It was way different than what we'd seen over the weekend. There weren't any dumb mistakes. I know that Shohei was sent. I don't know if that was his own decision or Phil Nevin's decision, kind of another stolen base attempt that doesn't really make sense when you have a runner on third with no outs, right? Kind of take the bat out of somebody's hand. Maybe they were just trying to break up the double play, but with Shohei's speed, I think that you trust him to get to second base, maybe take an early lead, take a, take off early as the pitch is going and make contact. So I'm not quite sure what Phil Nevin was thinking there, but it did feel like a much different team. There was a lot of good, in this one, right? Yeah, a whole lot of good. The bullpen was mostly good. Tucker Davidson came in, filled nicely, filled in nicely for Shohei Otani. Uh, and three and a third inning. Yes. Perfect Tucker Davidson. Absolutely. Outing. Because yeah. anything more than that probably would have been a disaster. And he gets rocked. <laughs> yeah, he gets rocked. And then, and then Matt Moore, Johnny, I was... Mm -hmm. at at peace when Matt Moore came in and he came in at just the right time and they let him really fill out his time on the mound. And then Jose Quijada, my confidence in him is really starting to grow Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. because he comes in and he's throwing heat and they're, I think they're using him out of all the things that we've been really frustrated with when it comes to the management of this team. I think that Jose Quijada has been used really, really smartly and wisely. And then I know it was a shaky ninth inning for Estevez, but he got the save. He was fired up when he struck out that last batter, and you could tell he really, really wanted it. That was the good, the mostly good from the bullpen. Johnny, Aaron Loop. Aaron Loop. Aaron Loop. I I actually feel bad for this guy because it just seems like everything he does is awful. It's gone. He doesn't have it. Right. Honestly, and I don't know if he can find it, John. I just don't know if he can find it. And I know I've shared on this pod that I think Aaron Loop and Ryan Tapera should be like the bridge guys in a game like this, like fifth inning, sixth inning. Loop can't even do that. No. And and I don't know if it's mental for him. I don't know if he just lost his mechanics, but he can't even do that. And, and actually, we're going to talk about this later this week, what the Angels should do with Aaron Loop on this roster. I think they can make some moves and it won't be very costly, but it just doesn't seem like he is able to find it and maybe – having him go to a different team would be better for him. I feel bad for the guy. And I also feel bad when he pitches for the angels because he's terrible when he comes in. I just don't understand where it went. It just never seemed to be the Aaron loop that people expected. Maybe he's just past his prime. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Look, if you can outright David Fletcher off the 40 man roster and put him in triple a, then you could do something with Aaron loop. And yeah. I know we're going to get to that conversation later on uh, in, in tomorrow's episode, but just, Yeah, for me, you've got to do something. There are plenty of other bullpen options that are really great that are waiting in the wings. Hey, coming up on Locked On Angels, who's the next prospect we could see in the majors? Well, Lindsey Crosby is going to join us to talk about Zach Neto, Logan O'Hoppy, and give us a little peek into the future of what may be coming for our Halos. Stay tuned. Locked on Angels is brought to you by So Rare. This is a revolutionary fantasy baseball game and marketplace transforming fans into owners with officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across all 30 MLB teams. Unlike other fantasy baseball platforms, So Rare managers truly own their fantasy experience, collecting, buying, selling, and competing with player cards against global opponents to win really incredible rewards like tickets and merchandise. It's really kind of 
awesome. So win or lose, you still own your cards and there's no cost to play, which is even more awesome. Plus, the more you win, the more you advance, you can collect increasingly powerful cards and accessing next level co- competitions and rewards. You can head to so rare.com slash locked on today. That's spelled S O R. A R E dot com to draft your team of free player cards to set your lineup and to start competing today to win really great rewards. Again, that's so rare.com slash locked on to get started and you can play today. Thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen today. Locked On Everydayers, join us every day this week as we recap each game against the Yankees. Probables versus the Yankees on Tuesday, it's going to be Jose Suarez. Wednesday is going to be Griffin Canning. Thursday will be Patrick Sandoval. Mike, there is a question whether or not Otani might start in New York. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. considering he only went the two innings and pitched around 30 pitches. So we might see that changed up. We'll, we'll stay tuned. We'll I say start him. <laughs> start him against the Yanks, right? Let's go. Otherwise, he's either going to start against the Royals on Sunday, and I, I feel like we could definitely use him in New York City. So, hey, so we're talking with Lindsey Crosby about Zach Neto being called up. And it was just an incredible uh, time and transition from being drafted as the Angels' first pick last June. And now here he is in the big. So here we go with our conversation with Lindsey Crosby. Well, we're happy to welcome in Lindsey Crosby of Locked On MLB Prospects. And if you're watching Locked On MLB Prospects, Lindsey's welcoming in us. We're the Super Halo Bros from Locked On Angels. So we're happy to get together and talk about some of the prospects that the Angels have called up for this season. And first, we're going to start out with Zach Neto. Lindsay, I have a funny stat here. Did you know that Zach Neto's last collegiate hit and the time between that and his first major league hit, 317 days? How about that? Less than a year. It very, very rarely happens. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Wow. Man, it, we were shocked to get the news over the weekend. But after the <laughs> defensive showcase that they put on on Friday against <laughs> the Red Sox, it was like, all right, guys, something's got to give here. Yeah. So we, a lot of people felt like that was very fast. And and I'm interested to hear, you know, when is it too soon to call up a prospect? When is a good time to call up a prospect? This is so there's no like clear definitive answer, right? Mm-hmm. But the way that I always look at it is can you answer the remaining questions about that player in the minor leagues? Mm-hmm. And so when you look at Zach Neto, uh, very good, good pitch recognition, very low strikeouts yes. in, in college. I want to say less than 10%. Yeah. Still kept it under 20% in the bigs. And so my questions were overall power ceiling and then defensively. How how long is the adjustment period to go from playing at Campbell to Major League Baseball athletes running to first base? Right. And when I watched a little bit in Rocket City last year, that was the observation was the arm is strong. It's a plus arm. Uh, the hands are good. The actions are good. But the internal clock wasn't right there. Hmm. Uh, you know, it, it would there would be times when he'd get a slow roller, he'd barehand it, and he'd go to rush a throw to first. And it's like, you don't have a shot at getting him. You need to just hmm. pocket that ball instead of throwing it. And so I was wondering how long would it take that clock to dial in? And, and you know, it's he's an instinctive player. He's pretty good with this stuff, but he's not dead on with it yet. And it's kind of hard to figure that out at the double-A level because of the level of competition, the quality of competition. So right. you can give him enough time in double-A, you would have been able to answer that question, but you can be 85% of the way there, bring him up and let him get the last bit at the major league level. So I'd probably expect a little bit of defensive issues here and there, nothing drastic, but give him some time to learn how long it takes, uh, you know, some of these major league players to get down the line. And like, that's your adjustment period is that. Mm. And then how does the power play at the major league level? Interesting. Where will he be great? That's the biggest question that I think a lot of Angel fans want to know. Like, if it, when he comes up, what does he bring to this team? What can we expect him to do really well? And where do you think, and you mentioned some of it, but where do you think he's going to need to grow a bit now that he's on the Major League roster and playing every single day? I think uh, at the very beginning, he is, like, he does raise the floor and raise the ceiling of your defense. I've watched mm-hmm. him make some very, very good plays. Again, the question is, how long does it take to transition? I also think he's a very good base runner. He doesn't steal yes. a ton of bags, right? Mm-hmm. 
But when you watch him, he's very good at going first to third on a single, mm -hmm. at threatening a single into a double, uh, scoring from second on a base hit, things like that. Another situation where you have to wonder, you know, the first time he tries that against one of these major leaguers with a massive arm, you know, like a Ronald Cunha Jr. or somebody like that, what happens? But I feel like that's a positive element he can bring that you weren't really getting from David Fletcher's game. And then uh, you can also just get the approach at the plate very good against velocity, which again, from a smaller school, that's a little surprising, but he has a baseball background. Uh, and, and the overall quality of contact. He's very good at not chasing, very good at making solid contact in the zone. So uh, again, the whole question here is, one, the adjustment period it takes for him to get to MLB. And then the bigger one is, once opposing pitchers get a book on him, how long does it take him to adjust to that? Those mm. are the two big questions. The first one is he got, I, you know, I, I want to say he picked up his first hit today. Uh, you know, he's, he's looked good at the plate. He hasn't been completely fooled on stuff. Once they start to get a book on him and figure out here's how we get him out, what's his adjustment period like? That's my mm. big question. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, just in the short sample size that we have of him in the bigs, I agree with the plate discipline. Mm -hmm. I can tell that that guy has a good eye at the plate. He's not chasing stuff out of the zone. He did get robbed of an at bat i would say in his first game due to some bad strike calls off the zone right so to me that says you have great discipline at the plate you have a great eye for the zone the that umpire was pulled and you weren't yeah. yes exactly <laughs> and then Lindsay, he got a high fastball up in the zone 96 and that was his first hit and mm. it went out to the i want to say between you know left and center field and it was a single and then, as you said, he stretched that next single, first to third, got on third, was able to score because of it. Mm -hmm. So I was really impressed with the base running as well. And the other thing that I noticed, he's making good contact, good, hard contact. A lot of his ground balls went right to third base, and he got Rafael Devers over there. Imagine, you know, <laughs> starting on Jackie Robinson Day at Fenway, you know, in this... In this esteemed stadium that's your that's your first day you know but i think he put the nerves behind him because mm -hmm. all throughout the series it seemed like he was making great contact and he finally broke through for that first base hit which was great yeah he doesn't have the the overwhelmingly ridiculous raw power but he maximizes when he does make contact with the mm -hmm. ball when you if you measure it from just uh, you know exit velocity and things like that it's it's kind of modest but he does a good job at the swing as an uphill swing to get the ball in the air. He pulls the ball quite a bit, not to a detriment, but he understands the right way to, to leverage the, the barrel in the zone to get the ball up uh, and, and can backspin the ball pretty well. I, I think this year he's going to look more like the slash line of Adley Rutschman last year, more doubles mm -hmm. than home runs but something where he's going to be able to grow into that as he spends a little more time in the bigs. The thing we have to remember, he is still only 22 years old. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so it's probably more doubles power than home run power now and a lot of pull stuff. But I think the keys to look for to see how the power is coming in is when does he start to expand from just a pull hitter to more of the whole field, hitting the center, hitting the opposite way. Sure. And then when do those balls keep carrying instead of being doubles end up going out of the, the park. So Oh, when the Angels played the final game on Monday against the Red Sox, Taylor Ward sat, and so he usually leads off for them. So Zach Neto was leading off. Where do you think he slots best in a major league lineup? Because I know he was leading off some in Rocket City. So where would you place him? If you're, if you're Phil Nevin, where are you slotting him in your lineup every single day? I like the idea of putting him first. I do acknowledge that's probably a lot of pressure on a 22-year-old kid. It's like, hey, you're going to bat in front of Shohei and Mike Trout. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, good you luck. Know, <laughs> no I know you were at Campbell last year, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, this time, you know. Uh, so I like the idea of that. But if you're not batting him first, because Taylor Ward's back or whoever, whoever it, it may be, I do like the idea of having him somewhere towards the back end of the lineup so that he can use – He's not driving guys in for the most part, but he can get on base. He can take extra bases. You want him to be on base when that one through four come up to bat. So if you're not leading him off, have him towards the bottom of the lineup, almost like a second leadoff man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doesn't quite maximize the number of times he gets to the plate, but does give it when he is at the plate in the middle of the game, a good chance to get on and then get driven in. 
what's the <laughs> what's the limit for a prospect like this? Like, when do you see their play and you see how they're uh, taking their approach at the plate, and you go, mm, "We might need to reconsider this." Is is there a is there a line in the sand there? What do you think? It's t- for me. It's typically when they start to struggle. And they've had about two weeks of struggles. Mm. Like so, it it's not cut and dry a specific amount, but it's right. something where okay, uh, they you know he was rocking a twenty percent strikeout rate in Double A. He got up to about twenty eight or thirty percent in the bigs because they learned he chases the slider down in the way or whatever mm-hmm. it may be. Mm-hmm. He's had about two weeks to adjust to that. Are the numbers improving or is he still struggling with the same thing? That makes sense. Um, you know, and it's something where if you go back and you look at a lot of the good hitters in MLB. That's a similar transition they had to do. I can think about Austin Riley of the Braves getting sent back down because he struggled so much with that slider down and away, and it took him until the next season to be the Austin Riley that we know now. Right. So it's kind of two weeks after the struggles start, and the question is always, when are the struggles going to start? Uh, that's always the hardest part to, to, to answer, but uh, for me, it feels like for Zach Neto, they're going to come eventually. The question is, how quickly does he fix it from what I've seen of him, from what I understand from his, his his baseball background, his instincts and everything, I feel like he should be able to fix it rather quickly. It's just a question of when does it start? Well, from one rookie, Zach Neto, to one rookie that we're really excited about, Logan Ohapi. He's been our starting catcher. He has been our lead guy in home runs and RBIs. And you were the guy that predicted that. So you're a prophet. So we're excited about that. So tell us what you think about Logan Ohapi season so far. I'm honestly a little bit surprised by the power performance. I don't hmm. quite think I had this exactly the same. So some of the projections going into the season for Logan Ohapi had him, like I want to say in steamer and zips, he was around 240, 325, 420 was kind of the projection for Logan Ohapi. And I had him Somewhere, I, I had the power a little bit higher, probably about 430, 440 or so. He's got a 560 slugging right yeah, now. Yeah. So doing a little bit better than that. And I, I think part of it is he's been, same thing, he's been maximizing the quality of the contact. He's still striking out, uh, not excessively, but he's, right. uh, he's having those growing pains. But he's doing a really good job at making contact in the zone. So he's not missing hittable pitches, and he's getting quality swings on them when he does swing at them. And I want to say... I'm looking for the specific stat, but his his hard hit rate is something like 45%, hmm. and league average is like 36. Yeah. So he's maximizing that contact, especially in the zone, and that's one of the big differentiators, and I don't quite think he had that in the game when we saw him on that brief sample size last year. Right. Yeah, his numbers so far, 851 OPS, four home runs, 11 RBIs. You mentioned that you know those are some surprising numbers there but he's gotten off to a hot start, which has been great mm-hmm. for us. And, and everybody's shouting his praises right now. Uh, it's, do you feel like he's going to end up being more of an offensive guy or a, de- a defensive guy? So if, I mean, obviously if the bat keeps up, he's going to be not only an offensive guy, he's probably going to end up being one of the top five or 10 catchers in baseball. Mm. If the bat keeps up like it is, I, the reason that I've been so like, I felt like he was ready was I got a chance to watch him play in person last year. And yeah. the pitchers were just very, very comfortable with him. He looked comfortable behind the plate. The pitchers looked comfortable. The hitters did not. It kind of gave <laughs> me a good, good insight into his game calling and to the way he can handle a staff. And then his defense really good as far as blocking framing everything, except for the, uh, I think the high strike was a little bit of an issue. He, he was good. He's good at the low strike. Not so much the high strike. Uh, But if the power keeps up like this, I mean, you're looking at a top 10 uh, catcher in baseball. The the average catcher OPS for last year was like 663. And he's like, what, an 864 right now? And so, you know, not counting whatever he did did on Monday. And so, like, if you... Like if if he hits like this, he's a top five, top 10 catcher in baseball, especially if he can make 110 starts, 120 starts. Uh, it And I just, I don't quite think, I had him as a defense first guy who would be a good offensive player, but a plus defender. He's exceeded even my expectations. And I, I, I had lofty expectations. I joined a new dynasty league this year, a big money league. And first guy I went out to get was Logan Ohapi because nice. he wasn't valued correctly hmm. by the rest of the league. And I, by, I think baseball in general didn't really value him the way they should have, except for the angels. Now, 
there's this uh, tweet that got released, I think it was Monday, and people are saying that Logan O'Hoppy is going to play in New York for the first time since 2018 because he caught a home run ball from an opposing player and he threw it back in. You know, people are trying to decide if that actually is Logan in the stands or not. But the point that I want to make is that he just doesn't seem like a guy so far whose eyes get really big wherever he's at. I mean, he had to be the openings day starter for Shohei and Shohei was interviewed and said, I just want this guy to relax. And it was easy to get him to relax. Was that something that you noticed and why you were so high on him? Because the makeup of this guy just seems to be a mature individual who's ready to go. Yeah, it, it it's something where he never really felt like the moment was too big. I saw him bat in the ninth inning in a game where they're down and he, I mean, he's blowing a, blowing a bubble as he walks up to the plate, yeah. <laughs> just nice and casual. And like it, it's really, really hard to teach that mindset and to teach that comfort with yourself and your abilities and what you can do. It's a fine line between uh, confidence and cockiness. And he he's really good at being confident without being cocky. It doesn't come off as disrespectful, but he understands what he can do on a baseball field, understands what he can't do, and is really good at maximizing his abilities. And so it just... It it's on vibes like catchers. It's so hard to evaluate based on the statistics and the numbers. And it's really kind of vibes. And and so I rarely get to see a catcher, a top catching prospect in the minors and then be as impressed as I was with Logan O'Hoppy. And I mean, to the fact that I went out and got him in a dynasty league, like it's, it's, it's not common to see a guy that young who in a situation like he was where he gets traded, be that comfortable at the plate behind the plate and on the mound talking to his pitchers is everything about him sustainable in terms of the offense and the defense is there anything that might go away with age i know you mentioned last time we talked about him being so young and you know he's not quite grown up it's kind of the only way i can think about putting it but maybe adding more muscle in the future maybe adding some power to that bat in the future what do you think yeah, we, we typically see these young uh, baseball players not necessarily be fully formed products. Uh, physically at 23, there's a little bit of lingering strength gains. I have, we talk about things that are sustainable and not sustainable and what may go away. He's feasting pretty well on fastballs right now. Mm-hmm. 640 slugging on fastballs, whereas uh, I want to say breaking's 462 and off speed's 333. And nobody's really coming at him with off speed stuff. It's mm-hmm. mostly fastball breaking ball. And so I do think there's an adjustment coming where the league realizes not that he's bad with off speed, but we haven't seen him be as good with it as we have at everything else. And in the limited sample, it's like 12 pitches on the year. Yeah. Uh, he swung and missed more off, like over 50% on off speed pitches. Yeah, and so that makes sense. obviously context dependent, if you're geared up for fastballs, you've got nothing but fastballs, you're going to swing over a change up, but still something where I expect that adjustment to come. And then once that adjustment happens, how long does it take him to react to it? From what I've seen, it should be pretty quickly. The Southern League, especially last year, there was a lot of breaking and off-speed stuff, and he came in and was wrecking right away. So I expect him to adjust pretty quickly, but I'm still waiting for that to actually happen in a game. So on Saturday, we were shocked because Zach Neto was called up. So surprise us again. Shock us again. Who's the next guy, Lindsay? Because it seems like Perry Manassian is just cutthroat right now. You're not performing. He's going to go get somebody that he drafted. So so who who is that next guy? Let me get him up to speed really fast because okay. this, this is what happened, Lindsay. We had to option David Fletcher to mm-hmm. AAA outright. And now he's not on the 40 man roster. Yeah. This is David Fletcher, who has a $25 million contract, it's like five, six million a year, something around there. Somebody who has been an everyday person in the lineup. Had he's a great 2020. Had a great 2020 yep. and a great 2019 as well. And and he's been he has been hurt the last few years. Mike and I think that him getting reps in AAA is a great thing for him because off the bench, it just wasn't happening. And the other side of the coin here, mm-hmm. if you're an Angels fan, you know that. Every time the bullpen comes in, you're sick to your stomach. You're not <laughs> sure what's going to happen next. That's true. And Ryan Tapera just went on the IL. Aaron Loop uh, has just not been able to put it together. We talked about that earlier in our episode. And so that's kind of some things to consider as you take a look at who might be the next up. A lot of fans really want Ben Joyce on this roster. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. It is not going to be Ben Joyce. Oh, I can, wow. okay. I mean, I can, <laughs> correction, if 
if they are know what they're doing, it's not going to be Ben Joyce. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here's, here's the thing about Ben Joyce. And yeah. as, as somebody who watched him in junior college at Walter State, as somebody who watched him in tennis, like, at Tennessee, uh, as a credentialed member of the media covering SEC baseball, Ben Joyce, once in his entire career, going back to junior college, has like, once ever pitched on back-to-back days. Hmm. Wow. It's okay. just not a thing that he does. His time in, in college and last year, over 80% of his appearances were on two or more days of rest. Wow. And when you are a part of a major league bullpen, especially one that is having to cover multiple innings and is shorthanded because you're running a six-man rotation, mm-hmm. there is no way to sustainably carry somebody who is only available every third day. Hmm. It's just not, it just doesn't happen. I, Everybody's enamored because the fastball is incredibly fast. I get that. It's, I mean, it is legitimately an 80 grade pitch when he can command it. But I need to remind everybody I did a whole segment of a show yes. about a team that threw 14 innings in the minors over two games, gave up one total hit, and lost one of those games. And Ben Joyce was the man on the mound yeah. when they lost that seventh inning. Yep. He came, he came on in the seventh in a no hitter. Walk, walk, fly out, walk, strike out, walk. I mean, not competitive pitches. I went back and watched the outing. They Mm. weren't competitive pitches. He has a fastball that is fantastic when he can command it. He sails that sucker a lot. He has a slider that is above average. But again, he's still trying to figure out the best grip for the slider. And then again, he can't work on back-to-back days. He's done it once ever since high school and that was <laughs> and that was in college wow. and it was it, it wasn't even a conference opponent it was a non-conference opponent and i want to say the second outing was like seven pitches it wasn't even a lot and so uh, ben joyce is not going to be the guy that is called up i'm not quite sure who it's going to be because this system throws us for loops but right. it's not going to be ben joyce my choice if it was anybody would be someone like sam bachman okay who i think has made strides as a starter i really like sam bachman he's looked good in his first two starts in double A, but like the control looks good. The third pitch, the changeup has come in, but the, the fast boss slider combination are still really good and could work out of the bullpen. Mm-hmm. I feel like he's more likely to come up than a guy like Ben Joyce, who you can't count on back to back and you can't count on to even be able to find the zone knowing that you are limited. You have to throw him for three batters, even if he can't find the zone. Mm-hmm. True. True. Mm-hmm. So like, it's something where part of being a professional baseball player a professional pitcher is one learning to work back to back but two learning how to work when you don't have one of your pitches Hmm. and he hasn't he doesn't even he can't always work when he has both of them never mind if he doesn't have one so if the angels know it's good for them it's not going to be ben joyce (laughs) he's a one he's a wonderful young man unfortunately that 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 caveat is appropriate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the yeah. angels yeah. know what's good for them. The angels know what's good for them. <laughs> hey, hey, he's not ready for Major League Baseball. Double A is where he needs to be to yeah. continue figuring it out. Right now, he's thrown two and two thirds innings with five walks, mm-hmm. and the season's been going on for a week and a half. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, he's thrown he's thrown three times. So when we talk about bullpen names, how about like a Colton Ingram or an Eric Torres? Do you think any one of those guys would be a good move if the Angels needed to solidify that bullpen? I could see Torres as being somebody he's looked like in, in, in limited looks. He's looked good so far. I mm-hmm. could see him being a guy. Uh, it's, it's really down to, do you need somebody who can flex into a starting spot? Or do you need somebody who can, like, if you, if you get somebody who has a history of being a starter, you have the ability to put them in to eat multiple innings because right now having a short bullpen, you absolutely have to have guys that can go out there on a drop of a hat and take two or three innings later in a game and and bridge you over, save the rest of the bullpen. And I'm not sure if everybody down on the farm has that ability. A lot of the guys who are, have been relievers for a couple of years, aren't always stretched out and can handle multiple innings like that. That's why I I like the idea of a Sam Bachman, maybe a Kai Bush, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, If I, if I had to pick, I'm probably taking Bachman just because I like how his stuff has improved. But at the same time, I see the benefit of give him some more time to get settled and comfortable uh, with that change up and, and get a little more work in before you do it. But that's my pick of Sam Bachman. The angels certainly have a lot of options out of triple a as well. They signed a ton of bullpen depth with major league experience. And so I think before it gets to that point of, Hey, let's bring up 
another new guy for the season, <laughs> somebody right fresh off the trash pandas. I think they have a couple of other routes that they could go, yeah. but it is interesting to hear Sam Bachman potentially being, you know, the next exciting guy to, to come up and, and eventually we'll have the Los Angeles trash pandas of Anaheim. And we're okay with that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like, like half of the top 30 prospects are in rocket city, which yeah. makes sense. I mean, that's where you go for the most development. The Southern league is one of the better double a leagues uh, in baseball. So it mm-hmm. makes sense. And like, I love Edgar Cuero being there, just skipping Tri-City completely. <laughs> That's a terrible park to hit in. Doesn't help anybody's confidence. And so yeah, he, he went straight to double A, and he, I think he looks fantastic. Yeah. yeah. He's not ready to get called up yet. Don't do not do that. Dang but, it. No, no, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and I and when you mentioned it, there are, like, Sam Bachman's not on the 40-man roster. Mm-hmm. That's obviously something you have to think about here, whereas a guy like a Chase Silseth is in triple A mm-hmm. and is on the 40-man roster. So he's more likely to get called up than Bachman. I just selfishly, as the prospect guy, I want Bachman. Yes, I like Selseth too. Yeah, yeah. I just want Bachman because I've enjoyed watching him so far this year. And I think I think he deserves a chance to debut and see what he can do at the major league level. And you both have great beards. You and Sam Bachman have tr- <laughs> tremendous we beards. We work on that. <laughs> Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate all your insight and for breaking our hearts and telling us that, that Ben Joyce is not going to be on this major league roster anytime <laughs> soon. But it's good information because fans seem to think that they know what's best for this team. But you're paying attention to those players. And yeah. so I, I love the information you shared with us. So thank you so much for bringing that to us today. Thanks for having me, guys. This is always tons of fun. And I tell everybody, like, I have a bunch of angels on my fantasy teams because I enjoy watching the angels. I This is my West Coast team. And whenever I'm up late at night, I'm watching you guys play. So uh, go angels. Hey, thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen today. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. And remember, Locked On Angels is a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, be sure you give us a follow on Twitter at Locked On Angels to keep up with all the latest and greatest Halo news. And of course, you got to get at us at Super Halo Bros on Twitter and Instagram. And stay tuned after each game. We have our Locked On Now videos that give you a quick recap of what happened post game. Hey, Mike, what do we have on deck for tomorrow's show? All right, so we know that Angel fans have been melting down every time that we've lost a game this year, right? It's over. Otani's not staying. This is the worst roster I've ever seen. Exactly, and they're freaking out. So what we've done is we've looked at how fans are responding to their team from other teams, and Johnny, the meltdowns are pretty epic, and we're going to share those meltdowns tomorrow and compare those meltdowns to Angel fans on Locked on Angels tomorrow on the show. You know, the Diamondbacks are the only ones with a winning record in the National League West, so imagine how Dodger fans and Padres fans are feeling, and they spent way more money than we did, and we're sitting at about the same as they are, so we're going to talk about that tomorrow. Until then, my name is John, and that's my brother Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother John. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you to Lindsey Crosby for that awesome conversation, and we'll see you right back here for more Locked on Angels tomorrow.